Hello and welcome to episode 47 of the Physique Development Podcast. Today, we are starting a new five-part series all about program design. So episode one, today's episode, is going to be all about training volume. Episode two is going to be about training intensity. Episode three is going to be about training frequency and training splits. So how often are we training and what do those splits look like and how do we come up with those? Episode four is going to be about exercise selection. So how do we choose? What's the strategy of choosing exercises within our programs? And then episode five, the final episode of this series, is going to be all about training progressions, right? How do we progress our training strategically over time? And fatigue management. How do we manage those training progressions as the fatigue accumulates? Okay, but today is all about training volume, episode one. So to start off each episode, we're going to go ahead and review some definitions. So don't feel like you have to memorize this stuff, okay? If you're, you know, <laughs> taking notes, doing what you're, doing whatever we got to do, don't feel like you have to memorize this stuff, okay? Just try and stick with us and grasp the main concepts. That's going to be the important part. And this is going to help as we move through the episode and start to put some of this stuff into application for you, okay? So to start out, what is training volume? So training volume refers to the amount of exercise or work performed over a given period of time. Simple enough, okay? In most cases, this is given in terms of each training session or week of training, okay? So your next question may be, does it matter what type of training I am doing when it comes to volume? And the answer is yes. And we're going to get into that a little bit more. But first, we need to start to answer some questions. What's our goal for the training program? Are we trying to build muscle? Are we trying to build strength? Are we trying to build aerobic endurance or work capacity or our conditioning? In today's episode, we're going to focus on that building muscle question. Okay, so we're going to look at training volume in context to mainly building muscle within this episode. So when looking at programming for muscle building, the total training volume is typically expressed by weekly set volume. The total sets per muscle group per week. So each training week will be measured by the amount of training volume or sets that are performed per muscle group over the course of that training week. Okay, so if you're sticking with me here, for example, I'm going to give you an example that'll make a lot more sense. So for example, if you are training three times per week, you go into the gym three times per week. And in each one of those workouts, you do four sets of chest press in that workout. You'll be doing 12 total sets of chest volume across that week, right? So three times four, 12, we got that. Okay, so that's gonna account for your total weekly volume for chest. And so you can see how that example, it sort of works out for other muscle groups across the week. So within the available scientific research, somewhere between 10 and 20 sets per week per muscle group has shown to be effective for putting on muscle. But as you can see, this is a very, very large range, right? And we're going to get into some nuance here uh, as I open up the floor to Alex and Sue, but that's a very large range, right? So your next question may be, how do I know how much training volume I should be doing? And the best way to answer this question is to actually look at the amount of current training volume you're performing across a given training week, right? Right now, how much training volume are you doing? And this doesn't have to be an exact number if you're not sure, but I do think it helps to give it a little thought, right? It's important to have a rough estimate because it's best to base your decisions on what you or a client has been doing most recently. So let's say, Someone hasn't been training at all. How much should they start with? This is a common question. Take a long leave from the gym or someone's just starting with strength training or they're just getting back from an injury or what, what have you, right? Or let's say they haven't ever trained at all, ever, okay? I would recommend starting on the low end of that 10 to 20 rep range. And if they're new to strength training altogether, as I said, I would play it safe and maybe drop it down even more something like six to eight sets per week per muscle group. Okay, and we'll maybe touch on that here in, here in just a bit. Remember, quality is better than quantity. You're gonna hear that a lot in this episode. 
quality is better than quantity, especially as our goal is to build muscle strength, things like that. And we don't want to perform an amount of training volume that we cannot recover from. This is very counterproductive towards improving performance and putting on muscle over time. Okay, so some other factors, just to recap our definition section of this episode, some other factors that may play into how much training volume you or someone else can handle are going to be things like sleep quality, total stress, actual stress versus perceived stress, both count, the quality of your nutrition, the time someone has available to train or go to the gym, their training age, right? How long they've been training across their lifetime and how good at training are they, right? Things like that are also going to play into the total equation of training volume, okay? And so hopefully that introduction sort of helps you work through what training volume is, right? Because so the goal of that first section is essentially to get you up to speed with what we're gonna open up the floor to in the latter half of this episode and just creating conversation around training volume. Okay, so I'm gonna open up the floor a little bit and I wanna pose the question, Alex or Sue, whoever wants to sort of answer first, um, how much does skill, so the skill of lifting weights or the, the skill of having good exercise technique actually play into volume needs and does quality matter more than quantity as we alluded to earlier? Uh, skill plays in quite quite a bit. Um, and the reason for that is when we look at our reps and how we're performing them, it is going to depend on a few different things. So it's going to depend on your execution, your tempo, um, if you're picking the right exercises, which obviously we'll be talking about later in this series, but um, at the exercise selection um, and the resistance profile within that, as well as what your intent is, how you use that load, your work to rest ratio, and so on and so forth. And so it is something where I'm going to throw it over to Alex here in a second and kind of pose the question in a little bit of a different way. Um, but if you do not have execution, you are not efficient within a stimuli, then that is going to affect kind of what that volume can be. And I think a perfect example is honestly my most recent training where Alex had sent it over to me and he said, hey, for a less experienced lifter, this would be very metabolic based. But for yourself, it's going to be kind of in between. You're going to get a little bit more hypertrophy than a more beginner lifter might get. So I think that touching on that would be really helpful. Sure. And I think that with the skill component is going to come an understanding of what stress actually feels like on the tissue. So for example, if, if someone is just for the first time barbell back squatting it's going to feel like it is uh, very foreign and then the coordination is going to improve as time goes on so that's going to be a skill acquisition uh, that's going to play a role in the overall volume that you can handle because if you're not able to simply squat down and stabilize the tissue or the joints specifically um, you're not going to be able to, to accumulate a whole lot of you know, quality volume and then furthermore not even understanding how much load it truly is like if you've never taken a set to failure you're not going to know where that line of failure is. So if we're utilizing things like an RPE or an RIR scoring for your assessment within the training, well, you're not going to be able to ut utilize those tools very well because you don't have an understanding of what failure truly looks like. Mm -hmm. And so those are very important skills from a coordination and failure standpoint are going to be two big skills that play a huge role in how much volume you can or cannot perform. And then within the aspect of the different training stimuli uh, affecting clients differently, if we look at things from a, an individual who is, is a beginner, what's going to happen is that if you hear us talk about this program design over the, this time frame, we talk about strength-based training or hypertrophy or uh, aerobic uh, capacity standpoint of, of training, that new trainer or even someone who's at the early stages of an intermediate trainee, they're going to get all those benefit from just simply being in the gym. Everything is very foreign to them. Thus, it is all going to be this mass production of a stimuli. And so in that context, as you get more and more advanced uh, per se within your skill set, you're going to be able to handle the volume itself in a different capacity, as well as creating more tension over you know, multiple sets and those different things to create a different response. So for Sue specifically, in that setting, she's able to create much greater tension and uh, allow for greater volume um, buildup, if you will, that would create a more mechanical tension or hypertrophy type response. 
Yeah. And I I think that that comes down to the fact of exactly that, the skill that you have in that and being able to also take those outside factors that Austin mentioned in regards to your sleep quality, your stress and your ability to train. Because looking at myself as a new trainer and what that looked like, or a new trainee, I should say, um, is something that I was basically getting the weight from point A to point B. And now I, or then I progress to, all right, I'm now understanding what muscle group I'm working that I'm still getting things from point A to point B, then progressing to the point of, hey, I understand exactly this resistance profile, exactly the musculature, and I can create an intense amount of tension for this muscle, where a beginner might need more sets because they can't get the same amount of volume that someone more efficient within their training can get. So it comes down to the fact that reps aren't all created equal. So performing six reps with a weight you could do for 40 reps isn't the same as performing six reps with a weight you could only do for six reps without hitting failure. And it's the same thing of lifting a weight with a crappy technique where you're lifting the weight with whatever your body can lift it with. You are utilizing other musculatures to be able to get that moving. You're um, using muscles. I'm losing my words. This is what I'm doing. You're <laughs> you're using extra muscles or muscles that aren't supposed to be in that movement to just get through the movement, like I said, of getting to point A to point B. And that's not going to be the same as lifting with good technique. And then it's something that, like I talked about, that significant tension. The better you get at creating that tension, um, it's something that the better quality of your reps and the less qual quantity, you will need to create that same effect. So that is going to be that efficiency that we talk about here when it comes to training volume. And I know that this seems like a lot of information and a lot of our podcasts are, but it's not something, and Alex honestly taught me this, that you need to memorize everything you hear in a podcast or a documentary. Take out of this what you need. If you learn one thing that you can apply to yourself, to your clients, or if you are a client of physique development, if you learn one thing that you can apply, this was a beneficial podcast. Even if you couldn't apply everything, you couldn't retain everything, you didn't memorize and perfectly apply everything. If you took one or two things and are able to help yourself or help your clients better, that's what you want to think about within this. So if you were to say, all right, now I understand there's a difference between the quality of reps and that's what you took away from this so far, that is perfectly fine that that's what you took away to be able to keep progressing and moving that needle forward. Right. Understand the broad concepts, right? Being a good test taker is different than being good at that line of work in in real life, right? You can be straight A test taker, know every fact under the sun, but putting that knowledge into application is one of the most challenging things to actually do, right? And that's coming from someone experienced that in real time, right? Trying to get from the test taking to the actual real life knowledge and application of those concepts, right? So take these broad concepts, take these, you know, more specific concepts, but take them broadly and just understand what you can, right? And if you have to listen back, listen back. So I did want to mention just really quick that that <clears throat> mention of resistance profile that may have tripped some people up. So um, Sue, so do you want to kind of go over what a resistance profile is, um, you know, kind of is it where in the rep range or where in the, the actual <clears throat> exercises, is, is it most challenging um, or does it have to do with the movement? What does it have to do with? Yeah. So re- resistance profile, a very easy way to break it down um, is going to be looking at something like a dumbbell lateral raise versus a cable lateral raise. While you might think, oh, those are the same movement and I can kind of use those in the exact same way. The resistance profile is different because of the way that the tension is created throughout the movement. So it is going to be not only where the movement is the hardest that you do need to take into consideration, but how that movement progresses throughout that whole movement. So if you take, for example, a cable lateral raise, Um, versus a dumbbell lateral raise, it's going to be a little bit harder to get that movement up because of the resistance that's added from the cables versus just gravity and now has gravity and the cables. Um, So Alex, if you want to step in and clarify that further, if I, if I confuse some people. (laughs) More so you're going to have a change in overall resistance within the dumbbells. And then you're going to have a constant tension within the cable itself, because the cable is going to be an applied force from that singular cable. Whereas you're going to have the gravitational pull within the the dumbbell. 
Yeah. Told you I was losing my words. That was a lot cle- <laughs> more clear than what I was. Yeah. I was thinking it, but I wasn't yeah. saying it. <laughs> yeah. No, that was that was good. I, I think that's helpful. And so where in the rep is that movement the hardest and most challenging is one part of that. But also you have to then think about, right? So understand that concept, right? Where in the rep is it most challenging? But also that resistance you choose for that exercise starts to apply as well, right? So using free weights is going to add a different resistance where that is going to be more challenging throughout the rep versus something like a cable, right? And I, I've already, I already know in, in kind of coming up with this series, I already know we're, I think we're going to have a 201 curriculum here, yeah, right? Where probably. we can get a little bit more into the weeds, right? So we're not going to get too far into the weeds here, I promise. Um, and I, I think we'll have a 201 series where we kind of get a little bit more nerdy and, and break some more things down here. But um, I wanted to kind of open up to applications that we use with our clients here at PD, right? So We'll start with Alex here. Um, What have you noticed within the training volume of incoming clients? uh, And how does this compare to how you adjust their programming moving forward? So incoming incoming, uh, clients, they generally come with a pretty high volume of of training allotment. So uh, for me specifically, I'm going to have um, contest prep clients. And oftentimes that comes from a very high volume training background of like, seven to 10 exercises for like three to five sets of 10 to 15 repetitions on these. (laughs) I mean, it it is some wild training volume. Um, And as you guys have already heard us talk about (laughs) seven to 10 exercises with three to five sets a piece is a little bit abundant for, and it's mostly just glutes and delts and it being pretty, you know, challenging of like, "Eh, that's pretty over the top. So for majority of incoming clients, we are more often than not going to program in a low volume fashion. And this can be uh, for a couple of different reasons. One, they've got to get out of the, the training that they were doing. It was not conducive to their overall growth, those different factors. But more often than not, we also have to address some overall biomechanic and um, exercise execution needs that they have where when you are training at these high volume allotments of like supersets of 15 repetitions, the likelihood that you are truly contracting the tissue that is needing to be trained is pretty low, but also the speed in which you're trying to rush yourself. I know that I've tried to count to a set of 15 (laughs) and those first five to seven don't look super great. And then my last probably two to three are really good repetitions because I'm like, yes, I'm finally getting close. I'm 12 is close to 15. I can actually start trying to contract the muscle because I I made it here. I've (laughs) I've arrived. So within that, we generally go with a more strength-based stimulus or um, exercise execution-based stimulus where we are working on the overall mechanics. And this can be very frustrating for the client because it's like, damn it, dude, I'm coming here to to put on tissue and you've got me trying to learn how to uh, push my hips back in an RDL, or you're trying to get me to actually perform a split squat without bouncing off of the floor and these different things. Like it does require us potentially to take three steps back, to take 10 steps forward in that initial phase. And the client that's able to um, agree to that and invest and, and believe in that concept, those are the clients that you see from us specifically that are able to put on this crazy amount of muscle tissue in eight, 10, 12 weeks, whatever it is, and make these crazy strides over an improvement season because they were willing to just do the boring stuff and doing the stuff that maybe made them feel a little bit uncomfortable, but in the long run had benefited them immensely. So to answer that question, training volume generally has to come down from when they, you know, where they came from. Yeah. And people normally come to us with a shaky foundation. So like Alex said, of doing the boring stuff is that people come with not having as great exercise execution. They probably have unchecked stress. They aren't prioritizing sleep and a multitude of other factors that go into your training. People like to look at it as there's training and nutrition, and then there's everything else um, where it's, it's not that way. There's everything plus the training and nutrition. And that was probably my biggest personal mistake is that when I first got into training, I was just thinking I'm doing the training, like that's all that matters. But I was not prioritizing sleep, I was not managing my stress. And that impacts your training, your recovery from training, as well as what you're able to put into training. And so it is something where those steps backwards that you're taking are really just like, 
solidifying the foundation. You're not necessarily taking steps backwards. You're really making sure that foundation is ready to freaking go so you can build a brick shit house on it and it not sink to the ground because you have so much dysfunction. So trust me, we want to get you to that <laughs> that brick shit house place where you have so much muscle and you're exactly where you want to be, but we want to make sure that that doesn't fall through into the basement either. Right. And every step of the way for all three of us, we've had this, what I sort of call this foundational period of time where we really focused and it just accepted taking a few steps back. And I think at the time, I, I remember first showing, you know, when we, we started to really kind of get into this and we'll kind of get into first programs, but uh, here in a bit, but I remember <clears throat> kind of showing Alex this, this program and it was kind of like, no, I don't, I don't think so. Um, no, it, it doesn't look like what I want to be doing and it's not going to be conducive to, to building, growing and, and all these things. And it's like, you know what? Fair enough. We've yeah. been doing pretty good so far, but right. I think we should try it. Right. I, one, I pay a lot of money for it and I think we should, try, <laughs> I, I think we should try it out. Um, and honestly, we went through this really you know, intimate growth period. Uh, and I know suited as well, where you sort of accept your fate of being reluctant to change, but you, you accept your fate of, okay, I'm going to have to take a few steps back here. Performance may on paper go down, but we've seen it time and time again, not only with ourselves, but with so, so many clients that we've worked with that you're going to take anywhere from five, 10, 15 steps forward. And it is pretty, it's a pretty stark contrast in my experience of not only the results you can potentially get, um, especially if, you, you know, even though if you've been training for quite a long time, you know, and, and I'm, you know, Alex just shared a, a client where his, you know, his, he, I'd say he's a pretty advanced person, but he, you know, in a very short period of time has sparked a lot of new growth, you know, especially in his back, just mm -hmm. by sort of Insane. correcting the exercises you're selecting, uh, appropriating volume to the goal, all of those things, right? And so even if you've been training for a while, you can still spark new growth from paying attention to these things. Yeah, I I have my a client myself who um, she is also a a coach and she has said this is the most progress I've ever seen in these last few years um, of us working together where it doesn't have to be something where you have to be brand new to see this progress if you don't have it already figured out then you can figure it out and still see that progress forward. So another note on that is it's really never too late to, to implement it. You don't have to think, I've already been doing this for a while. It doesn't make sense to implement it. Trust me, it still definitely does. It's definitely still worth it. Yeah, good point. And so Sue, I'm going to ask you this question or start with you here. Does training volume differ per muscle group? And if it does, by how much do you find? And obviously, it's going to depend on the person, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's largely going to depend on the person as well as kind of what we talked about before, what amount of volume they were doing beforehand, and then what we figure out that they can truly recover from within a, a space that they're in and know that that um, ability to recover can change throughout your time with that client. Or if you are the client, it can change for yourself where I have a client who she came to me and stress was really high and her body was not recovering. We dropped down volume and we just started to bring that back up and put it in a better spot. Um, but as far as per muscle group, that is going to depend in regards to what weaknesses someone has, if they have any imbalances within their physique that is that are causing issues, as well as where they want their physique to go. So as Alex alluded to, as a lot of bikini girls will come to him just doing glutes and delts, where that is something where you might have more of a bias of volume towards those glutes and um, delts and might have a... Um, maintenance volume for some other things. So that's something to, to keep in mind is there is going to be a level that you can atrophy, which we won't really talk about. There's a level to maintain the muscle that you have. And then there's a level to bias that muscle that you want to have. And so for myself, I have a lot less training volume towards like my biceps and triceps. And I have more training volume towards my delts and my chest um, and my, my glutes and my legs. And that's going to be 
just due to the nature of competing, but it's also something where um, for example, males that come to me might not have a, a great spot for their glute muscles. And um, as they age, if you do not have those glute muscles in a good spot, that can really cause some pelvic dysfunction. And so focusing and having more volume towards that is going to be more beneficial in that regard. So it can 100% differ um, per muscle group. And it is going to be extremely dependent on the person and scenario that that person is in. And I, I think that uh, a couple of different points there is that if there's a, a bias of tissue for the individual, I think that everybody comes with kind of a goal of like, I want to grow this. And so then at that point, you would probably have a greater density of, of frequency and volume towards that tissue specifically, um, provided that you're able to execute. And so the ability to execute, and we talked about skill, skill and execution are, are kind of, you know, one in the same, but in that that's going to be a huge driver of how much volume needs to be, um, there for the individual. If we're working through a, um, a lot of the execute, like exercise execution and trying to get the movement patterns down, we may have more total sets, but our repetitions may not be crazy high. We may have like seven sets of five, for instance, just as an example. Um, but in those, we're not going for a high RPE. We're just trying to nail every single repetition and be able to build those up. And the more reps that we get under our belt that are really good, now we can get into a place where we can really uh, create a lot of tension as well as put ourselves in an RPE that's going to be higher, that's going to elicit a, a greater degree of growth or what have you. So I think that that's going to be a big thing. And then um, another thing is going to be dysfunction. So one thing that we see a bunch of is going to be um, a discrepancy either between like anterior pelvic tilt, so the strength of someone's rec fem and, and hip flexors relative to their their lower back, um, and that like that's going to come from potentially sitting in a seat too long, um, poor training mechanics, those different things. We also see dysfunction within the uh, with like through the chest and the the upper back. So just posture in general is another big one. Where for uh, in our our context, working with many women specifically, they maybe have had a, a breast augmentation or they've just been, they don't want to you know, put on chest tissue in general. So they're like, okay, I'm just not going to train chest at all. Whereas I, I understand that and it's not going to be to a level of volume necessarily that's going to elicit this, like I've got massive pecs and I am jacked now. It's going to be more of I just need functionality between allowing my scapula to protract and retract properly and allow for my shoulders to elevate and depress and like all those different things, being able to have proper function through the shoulder joint is going to come from a balance of, I have, I have strength and stability through my pec. I have strength and stability through my shoulders, through my upper back. All the tissue is going to work in conjunction with one another. So understanding those things is going to be important as well. So you may see a bias of volume if you have that you know, dysfunction. Those are two things that off the top of my head that we have to address. I mean, I would say nine times out of 10, when a new <laughs> client comes in, one of those two things needs to be addressed pretty abundantly. Um, and for either the coaches or for, um, individuals who are just training that are listening to this, it's important to get videos of exercises and paying more attention to how they're executing rather than like, okay, this is my top PR. Like you're going to have a little bit of breakdown in form on someone's top PR. Mm -hmm. I just want to see a working set from you. And I want to see how things move. I want to see different angles. I want to see like, for instance, maybe a, a, a lap pull down, like a neutral grip pull down. We want to see an angle from the back to see how your scapula moves. And then we also want to see something from the side to see where maybe core stability or elbow angle is going to reside. And those things are going to be immensely valuable and things that you can work on moving forward to maximize that movement specifically. And that's going to apply across all movements that you may be performing. Mm -hmm. Great points by you both for sure. And RPE, just for that to kind of like go back here, um, if you haven't heard that term, that's rate rating of perceived exertion. So essentially how hard was that set or how hard are you working? How high is that effort? and how close are you to failure, right? So that that metric that we use is kind of, a, it's a scale to one to 10, 10 being the hardest, one being the easiest. It's that metric that sort of gauges how hard you're working, how hard that set was, and how close you were to hitting failure, right? And so that, we're gonna talk all about in training intensity in episode two. So we're gonna put together how volume sort of interplays with training intensity, right? And how those two have a very intimate, close, 
some may say an adult relationship, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and so we're gonna talk about that in episode two. Um, and I, I think my next question here was kind of about exercises. Uh, and Alex, without getting too much into the weeds here, right? Because in episode, what was that going to be? In episode four, we're gonna talk about exercise selection, right? So without getting too much into the weeds, but kind of to allude to it a little bit, do the exercise exercises matter or the, the exercises that we are choosing to perform impact the volume in which you program for clients? Yeah, and I think that a simple analogy with this is that if we're looking at training the quads, if we were to be programming a quad focused heel elevated barbell back squat, for example, and then looking at a leg extension, the ability to uh, navigate through many sets of a leg extension is probably going to be higher than what we would be able to navigate from a barbell back squat. A barbell back squat is going to kick our ass probably in three <laughs> or four sets and be like, eh, especially at like a, a 10 rep range. Like if we can put this into context, maybe 10 rep range uh, for both exercises, how many sets could you sustain within that 10 <laughs> reps relative from a leg extension to a barbell back oh, squat? It's so going different. to be so different. One, because the, the aerobic uh, capacity of things, you're just going to be so much more challenged within the back squat relative to the leg extension, but also the muscular fatigue uh, and demand of those exercises, but then the lengths in which those, those tissues are being challenged and which we'll get into um, in you know, future episodes here within this you know, series. Yeah, it's something that um, a big part of that is also going to be stabilization that it has and then looking at the secondary movers. So within a leg extension, you have so much stabilization and you're just having to work that that extension part um, where within a back squat, you're having to have so much core stabilization and that is going to be your whole trunk of your body as well as back stabilization of holding the bar on your back, being able to uh, control your breathing a lot more. And then of course, the impact that has on your legs. So it's also looking at the output that you can have within an exercise where the output for a barbell back squat compared to a leg extension are going to be completely different outputs that you can have within that, as well as you are getting that secondary volume or that stabilizing volume that we could get into more weeds on that. Um, but it is something that I believe you asked about if the tempo um, affect that are the rest periods. And that does as well, because not only thinking about the stabilization and what output that you're getting out of that, but when we're looking at tempo and tempo is something that we could again, get into deeper weeds with. Um, but especially if you are a beginner, it's really just learning control of the movement instead of having this perfect, okay, I'm going to count one, two, three, one, 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 you are more so thinking of, hey, I need to have more control over this um, to be able to have this execution as a whole. And tempo is more important in programming when it's around similar lifts. Um, and it's less important when there's a greater variance in resistance profile, just something to keep in mind. But those rest periods are also going to impact it of, hey, I'm not going to put someone in a back squat with a, um, a deadlift to really hard exercises and put them back to back with like no rest. So that's going to be something you have to take into consideration of what that looks like for how you um, pick apart exercises, which I'll go ahead and answer that a little bit further um, once we take a look into the mistakes we made when we first started writing programs, because there's a big mistake that I made um, and a lot of people made for sure. Well, let's get into that. Let's let's dig in because this next segment is all about looking back at our first programs, right? What are the mistakes that we made that we either would change or not change regardless, <laughs> but what are some of those mistakes you start to? Yeah. So one blaring mistake that I made and many other trainers I know make or just people writing programs is you're just trying to annihilate people. Um, they get into this place of, I just need to make people sweat. I need to hear that people said it was the hardest workout and they felt so accomplished after it. And I need them to be sore. So using metrics that don't, don't matter slash don't actually push the needle forward um, as my base of how good a training session was. And some of you might listening 
might be listening to this and be like, oh, shit, that's still how I program. And that's okay because you don't know what you don't know. And so you take a few nuggets from this episode, you apply that and move it forward. But I had excessive junk volume. I had um, just, I mean, not knowing where to put exercises whatsoever, not understanding the flow of a workout um, and just trying to absolutely annihilate people to make them feel like they had accomplished something where we didn't necessarily have to kill them to have that happen yeah yeah what's uh before you go out what's what's junk volume just quickly for people who may not not heard that term literally just doing stuff to do it <laughs> like not even like something that's going to be applicable not pushing you towards your goal um, or doing excess past what your goal is needing as we talked about within the range of what it looks like for sets and training volume because this whole thing is about training volume if you just add on extra volume so let's even say for example you are resting in between sets and you feel like you need to be more, more proactive and you start doing burpees or something that's complete junk and extra volume that you're adding in that isn't pushing you towards your goal, but somehow you feel like is making things better when in reality, it's actually completely negating you from your goal. Yeah. I remember, uh, I read in a magazine, I think it was from Jim Stepani or something <laughs> in like bodybuilding.com or something, which I guess that's an online, that's more of a website, but, <laughs> um, it was more of like his approach to these high intensity rest rest periods. And I remember I went through a stint of like trying to just never stop moving, never rest. If I'm not you're, literally Sue's example, like if I'm not dumbbell pressing, I'm doing burpees or running around like a chicken with my head cut off sort of thing between exercises, right? Which is if your goal is to build muscle, build strength, improve your physique, all of those things, right? They're sure there's context to do some of these things and maybe some iteration of these things, right? But I think it should be a small part, a very small and very specific detail to you and what you're trying to accomplish versus like that's your just blanket approach to training, right? So important. But I, I wanted to touch on junk volume because it's, it is a popular term, but if you've never heard it, you're like, okay, I don't know yeah. what that sort of means. So productive versus unproductive volume towards your goal. But Alex, go. <laughs> What mistakes did you make? First, pr first programs that I wrote for myself. Um, I mean, quite, I don't even, it was definitely junk volume, I suppose, but it was just every exercise that was like conducive to that tissue that I was needing to train. I would just kind of put it in paper on the piece of paper. So true. <laughs> and then I would just go until I was like, I can't move like anymore. Like I'm, my lats are done. And, and what I you know perceived to be my lats at the time, <laughs> which was really just my upper back and rear delts and all that fun stuff. But I would basically just have all those exercises and go until I couldn't. And that was kind of just how those first training sessions went. And as you can imagine, um, it, you know, I was in some pretty, I was very sore, you know, Austin and I pulling uh, two sessions a day and thinking that splitting up the volume that way, which there, there's a little bit of merit potentially to what we were doing, but um, not a ton. And then within initial programming, I was in the same boat of just wanting people to give me feedback of this was very challenging. And um, I wasn't, I, I had made the assumption that if it was hard, they were going to progress. Whereas now my understanding is, is much more abundant than that. And so when we first started coaching, it was just, how can we make this difficult? I've had similar sessions to this. This is pretty difficult. Here you go. And I, I think that a lot of first time coaches are going to resonate very heavily with that of like, it's hard. You will grow if you just train hard. And in the general context for a brand new person, they're going to grow in some form or way or hurt themselves. It's really just going to be one or the other. But in the context of what we're really talking to is how can we optimize the growth and, and maximize that growth within the, the protocols that we're putting into place, whether it be a beginner or someone who's tr very advanced, these principles are going to optimize and maximize rather than just simply, we got this result, we want the best result. Yeah. And there's actually some interesting research uh, over the last couple of years that highlighted um i was i was listening to uh dr eric helms talk about this basically that you could theoretically do a tenth of the volume be it that it's you know close to failure 
you're training really hard. And we'll talk about training to failure. We'll talk about training intensity in the next episode, but just stick with me here. You can essentially, you could do a 10th of that volume and get 60, 70, 80% of the same result, right? Which is an interesting thing to think about, right? And that's mainly a note for someone who maybe gets discouraged that they can't do everything, so they do nothing, right? So if you can do something and do it challenging and do it hard and, and bring your all to, you know, a couple sets on something each workout or each, you know, a couple times a week, that can still be very productive. Muscle is a very interesting thing, right? And in, in the in the way that it adapts to stress. Um, and so just a note, right? Mm -hmm. Just a note. And doing too much, and right, and a note we made earlier is doing less, I think I made it, doing less, we'd rather do less essentially than do too much, right? Because we can always build and grow upon what we know we can recover from, right? But if you absolutely obliterate yourself for two weeks in a row, or let's say a couple sessions in a row, you're gonna find it very difficult, one, to return back to any semblance of baseline performance because you're not recovering. And you're gonna find it very challenging, especially if everything else isn't on point, like sleep and, and stress and nutrition and all of these things, you're gonna find it very hard to continue to try and grow anything, right? Mm -hmm. And obviously there's a lot of context to that, but it's very important that you understand that we'd rather kind of shoot low, aim low, improve quality of that volume that you're doing, and then once we have some baseline markers and like with our clients, we talk about biofeedback, right? We're kind of, we're, in, we're analyzing that feedback week by week and we're, we can kind of make these strategic judgments on, okay, we're good. We're recovering. Everything's checking out. All right, let's add some, let's add some volume to this equation, right? Let's add some intensity, right? Which we'll talk about in the next episode to this equation. So, um, any other big things I, I i can go but any other things i just think a, a big thing in regards to programming in general and just being a trainee in general is dropping the perception of what you think needs to be happening <laughs> so i think that a lot of what we were doing and whatever austin adds on was due to the perception that we needed to train in that way, or we needed to do more, or we needed to obliterate ourselves. And with Alex saying, you just go in and pick every exercise for that muscle group until Alex started writing my training. I don't think I had ever a structure or a plan. I just said, I'm training back and biceps today. I know I want to do this movement and this movement. And I would pop around the gym and I would have kind of a rough layout of, oh, I know I want to do this many sets and reps, but I would be like, oh, this is open. I really like this machine. I'm going to do this and I'm going to hammer it down. Um, and it was all because I had a perception of what I was supposed to be doing instead of just allowing myself to either learn about what I was supposed to be doing or to take that step just to get a little bit better as far as my execution or understanding that volume. Because I, first time I wrote a program, I didn't calculate the training volume. <laughs> Not once did that come through my mind to sit there and calculate the training volume. And that's very different than how I program now. Uh, but Austin would love to hear what your, uh, your, mistakes slash uh some stories of your first programming experience luck so yeah i think like you guys as well right and i think i'd also just write down every movement under the sun that i knew trained that that was identified with that muscle group right so it, it's like there's a lot of redundancy within my programming right and that that word redundancy is gonna come up throughout this series quite a bit, but especially when we talk about exercise selection and, and choosing our exercises. But there was a lot of redundancy in, in the form of, okay, if I wanted to train legs, all right, I know that I need to, okay, the squat trains the legs, okay, RDLs train the legs, okay, leg press trains the legs, lunges train the legs, split squats, are those the same as lunges? No. They're different. They train the legs. <laughs> leg press trains, uh, trains the legs. I don't know if I mentioned that yet. 
but it trains the legs. Maybe I'll do it again. Do I'll it attack again. it on at the end. I'll do it again. Yeah. And so We've you can that. see. That's that's I was about to say, you guys <laughs> yeah. have yeah, definitely done that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we've definitely done that. We, we definitely probably forgot. That. Workouts get so long. You're like, yeah. I don't think we did that. That was yesterday. Let's just go it's back. like, no, yeah. that was just two hours ago. <laughs> um, and so there's so much redundancy to that, right? And, and, that's why understanding some of these concepts and themes and why we wanted to create this series essentially is to essentially enlighten anyone who hasn't sort of been exposed to this information before, um, or if you've been exposed to some of this information, but it hasn't really been put into application or context for you. You know, I think that's one of my biggest things that I did at the beginning, um, which again, you just, you're trashed, right? But I, I think there's a sense of, a sense of ignorance. And I'm, I was lucky that I was young enough, athletic enough, well-fed enough, slept enough, had all these like other things in line that I wasn't quite sure I had in line, but I just did, that allowed me to sort of get away with some of this stuff. Um, but I can tell you now, as I've gotten older, all of those things, right, as we age, I can't really get away with those things anymore, right? <laughs> Especially if I want to be a productive human in the real world, like with my professional life and all of these things, right? Because your body can only handle so much, right? As a whole, regardless of training, right? So if you're taking up every bit of recovery capacity you have as a human with obliterating yourself with training, well, I hope you don't have any other plans you know, because yeah. nothing else is going to get done. Um, and then I think from like a, a volume sense, it was just asinine, right? So it's not only all of those exercises, it was like four to five sets. And then as we'll talk about in the next episode with training intensity and like how hard we're training within that, you know, multiple sets to failure, forced reps, you had to have a spotter on your last few sets because we're, we're, you know, send it, man, we're going, um, you know, there's and just guys, so many things. You guys even did times where you didn't start counting the reps until it was hard. And right. then you would start doing stuff <laughs> yeah. from there. So, so yeah. who even knows what oh. true amount of volume was being had at that time? Yeah. 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 There's absolutely <laughs> no telling anything else come to mind before we kind of close out this episode. No, just, I mean, an excessive level of failure sets. I mean, that kind of makes my skin crawl a little bit, Sue, bringing that up. But yeah, I mean, we would just take every set to failure for I three know. hours. You like listing out that stuff. I'm like, I literally am like having PTSD <laughs> of like experiencing this workout, like post, post the fact. I'm like, oh gosh, please no. Never want to go back to that. Yeah. And if you guys are trainers listening to this, I highly encourage you to perform workouts that you're training or you're designing for your clients have an idea of what you're asking people to do right especially if you're early on and you haven't really had much experience with it write a program for yourself of what you think you would well write a program for yourself and then go and do it how close did that match to the difficulty you thought it was going to be and if you're early on i'm gonna tell you you're definitely gonna overshoot right? And that's okay. But just one of the biggest things that's helped me throughout my time, not only training, but as a coach has been doing that, going through some of these sessions, you know, I'm programming for people and expecting them to do. And then I, as I'm going through it, I make notes. I'm like, oh, wow, this was, oh, a fifth set on the squat. How rambunctious were you? Like not a shot that you know, Susie can do this. Why would you ever ask her to do this? Right. And like, why would you do, you know, putting this exercise combination together, I barely survived. So I can't imagine, you know, my 55 year old male client that, you know, is just trying to go to the gym to like get better. Right. So little things like that are very, very, very helpful as you're starting to learn about these things and these concepts of program design. So wanted to end on that little thing, but I wanted to end each episode with a recap uh, of what we kind of talked about in today's episode, right? What are the nuts and bolts? So training volume refers to the amount of exercise or work performed 
over a given period of time, right? In most cases, this is given in terms of each training session or week of training, right? Thinking of sets per week in context to kind of what we talked about today. The next was understanding where someone has been can lead you to know where they need to start, right? So if they've not been training at all or they've never trained, well, we know we need to start low. If they've been training and they've been crushing it and cruising and recovering, then we know that we can be a little bit more aggressive with those, those numbers and the, what we're expecting from them. Okay, we would rather start low and build than the other way around. And then less training volume with more focus on quality may actually yield better results. And I'm here to tell you, taps mic, it does, <laughs> <laughs> with less total stress on the system, right? So it may actually yield better results with less total stress on the system. Win-win, right? Can't win. beat that. Yeah. Because <laughs> you win, win as the coach for programming <laughs> that to have the win-win for the client. Right. Exactly. <laughs> And then quality beats quantity, right? Not all reps are created equal. Okay? And I want to close out with a question. It kind of leads us into our next episode. Does performing reps using more weight or intensity or effort actually lead to more productive gains, right? So does effort matter? So in next week's episode, episode two of this series, we're going to dive into this concept or this question a bit more, right? So episode two of this Program Design 101 series is going to be all about training intensity, how hard we're training and how much load or weight we are lifting. And Sue, what are these band tees all about? They're just about, they're the tits is what they're about. <laughs> um, the, we've gotten so much positive uh, response from these band tees of the quality of the band tees itself, of people just loving the way the shirt feels on them, how it performs, as well as a kick-ass design um, on it as well. So it's something that we do want to upkeep that quality within the clothing that we put out. And within that, we might have something in the works. And within that, we might need to clear out some stock to make sure that we're good to go. So since we love you guys so much as our PD podcast listeners, if you use the code PDPOD on the Physique Development website to buy a band tee, you'll get 10% off just for being a podcast listener. Now, if you get the bundle, the bundle already has a discount on it. So that'll already be applied. But if you just get one shirt, you will get that 10% discount. Um, and one thing I want to say about this series and just this podcast in general is that we really try to make it so that if you are a coach and you're trying to learn and be able to help your clients better. If you're a PD client or if you are going at this alone, you can each one of those uh, categories can take something out of these podcasts. Um, this isn't just a podcast for coaches. It isn't just a podcast for serious lifters. It is a podcast that any one of those groups and possibly some other groups I'm missing can take something out of this, apply it to their own life. And we always try to make side notes of, hey, if you're going at this loan, take this into consideration. If you're a coach, take this into consideration. If you're a client, take this into consideration. Because we do want to be able to help those groups of people to continue to progress um, and to be able to get the most out of their training, their nutrition, their mindset, um, their results as a whole. So that is a huge mission of PD. Um, and we hope that we are continuing to push that forward and that those little tidbits that we take time out to make those side notes are helpful. But if you are listening in the show notes, um, there's also going to be a, a link to a form that you can fill out if you have further questions. And especially in this series where we're going over a lot of stuff and it is a lot of information, go ahead and ask a question. We might do a six part to this or just kind of a follow up of answering all of the questions throughout this series so that we can better provide for you guys to make sure that you're moving the needle forward either with your clients or with yourself. Any closing statements, Alex? No, that was all really good. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and I think, um, you know, when I was kind of organizing all of this, I, I had it in my head of like, we're probably definitely going to do an episode six, right? And trying to put all this information together all into one episode where you can take it and apply it, right? So- expect that. But yeah. do ask your questions because your questions will actually lead that conversation in episode six, right? And we want to be sure that we aren't just assuming what you guys want to know or need help with. We want to actually help, right? That's 
the whole reason we spend time to do this. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> do fill that form out. That's a Google form. You'll find it in the show notes. If you don't know what the show notes are, just scroll down if you're listening on any platform. There'll be notes there. Those are the show notes, right? <laughs> Those are the show notes. <laughs> Those are the show notes. All right. We're going to cut this one. Episode two is going to be all about training intensity. See you in the next one. Catch you on the flippity flip.